be three o'clock. After that, I don't know, I went to bed myself, so <laughs> I don't know what he did after that. I was up because I was feeling bad. This was Thursday night, early Friday morning. I was feeling bad. I always feel bad in springtime. And I know I shouldn't. I know you're supposed to feel happy in Easter and Passover and all, and yet I just don't. I never do. I always feel sad. It's a time of uh, change, spring is, and uh, a time when nature seems to remind us in many different ways that, uh, that we are temporary and uh, we can be replaced. The world changes so dramatically and it raises your hopes in ways that can't be fulfilled. I feel sad, sadder and sadder as I get older in the springtime. It's like an old sweet tune that I can't dance to anymore. Not that I ever could dance exactly because I was raised in a fundamentalist home as you may be able to tell if you ever see me walk across a room you know or sit down in a chair I we were not allowed to dance or engage in any kind of a rhythmic physical movement <laughs> be in a marching band or anything else like that and as a result I tend to move uh, sort of like God has not quite figured out how to work the strings, you know, and uh, doesn't know which are the leg strings and which works the lower jaw. <laughs> kind of grope my way around a lack of physical grace due to my upbringing among the sanctified brethren. Sweet, good Christian people, and yet they do leave their mark on a boy. <laughs> I try to be as graceful as I can. I try to walk into a room. I try to sweep into a room now, carrying um, a little glass of uh, kind of a white Zinfandel in my left hand and, uh, and uh, try and sweep into a room. And people look at me sweep and they say, you're Baptist, aren't you? <laughs> but I'm not, you see. We considered Baptists to be loose. We were, <laughs> we were the other way, and we we couldn't we we couldn't uh, dance because uh, we were afraid. We were supposed to be afraid that it could awaken our uh, carnal uh, desires. Dancing might awaken them. My carnal desires were not only awake; they were dressed and had had their breakfast and were. <laughs> We're out waiting for the bus to come and uh, pick them up. But this was the uh, this was the theory in my youth. I just wanted to dance, just wanted to dance with girls, so that they would understand me better and know that what I lacked in aptitude, I more than made up for in sheer interest. <laughs> But I never got a chance. The school bus was um, my first contact, I guess, with girls and kind of a strange one. Because if I've told you this before, I apologize. I uh, lived out in the country at the end of the school bus route, the last person to be picked up. And as a rule, all the seats were filled when I got on. But Wendell, the bus driver, made me find one anyway. And nobody would let me sit down by them. I was about 10, 12 years old at the time of which I speak. And I had to hurl myself at a seat with the tiniest girls in it. I would just hurl myself at them <laughs> and force my way in and push them in and then brace my foot against the seat opposite and push against them. And that was my first physical contact with girls. <laughs> was pushing on them and hitting them with my elbow as they were pushing me back and saying, get up, get away, ish. <laughs> Go on. So you can understand if, you can understand if 
My attitudes might be strange now. <laughs> it was an odd upbringing, especially in the spring when you hoped and wished and wanted things to be different. Standing out there on a gravel road in your best new spring shirt and spring jacket and your chino pants and a pair of penny loafers, a new pair of penny loafers. I couldn't believe my mother would go for something so impractical as penny loafers, standing there waiting for the yellow bus to come and imagining that this morning it would be different and that the door would open and Wendell would smile at me and I would walk up and they would start clapping, <laughs> my classmates. And Dee Dee would have saved a place by her in the front seat and would look up at me and say silently, moving her strawberry lips, sit by me, <laughs> sit here by me. And the bus pulled up and the door opened and Wendell looked like the side view on a wanted poster. <laughs> and I walked up and nobody would give me a seat. And Wendell looked up in his big mirror, similar to the kind that guards use in penitentiaries. And he said, sit down, state law, sit down or I'm not going. I said, I don't mind, just, I could just crouch here or something. Just hunker, huddle here. I don't mind. I looked at them, my cousins, my classmates, neighbor children, my friends, I thought. Chucky, can I sit here? Can I sit by you? Barb, sit by you. She looked up. Her lunchbox was sitting by her. She said, what, you want me to hold it on my lap? I can't sit there. Sit by them. No place to sit. He looked up in the mirror. He said, sit down or else get off. <laughs> so I got off. I was 12. What do you do seven miles to school? Do you walk or do you go home and tell your parents that you missed the bus? Yes, you're right. So it was two hours. Two hours it took me to walk to school because I tried to cut across Tolerud's field and there was a pond there from melted snow and it didn't look that deep. And I got into it and then it was a little deeper than I thought. And I had faith that maybe the Lord would just take me across on the surface if I ran fast enough. <laughs> and I ran across and I got to the other side and my new penny loafers were all wet, flopping like slippers. I knew they were ruined. I walked into school, into the classroom. Miss Allison didn't notice me. I slipped in the back door two hours late in the sixth grade classroom and slid into my desk just as she said, well, Today is the day for the class reports on the first sign of spring. Gary, would you like to go first? <laughs> well, this is my report today. 35 years late. She's dead, Miss Allison. She's sitting up in the teacher's lounge up in heaven having a smoke. <laughs> and this is my report on spring. It's no fun, Miss Ellison. Spring is a rotten time of year. It breaks your heart. It was years after that, in the spring, when my son was born, and about five years, one spring after he was born, we decided that we would let our cat have kittens so this boy could see the wonder of life in the spring, the beginning of new life. We had a cat named Mrs. Swanson. She was married anyway, so she could have kittens. And we put her out. One day she was in heat. She actually went out on her own. She was in hot heat. She, <laughs> she kind of put on some lipstick and went out into the front yard and kind of lolled around there for a while, smoking cigarettes and drinking daiquiris and singing 
church songs. And the gentlemen cats of the neighborhood sat and watched her. They'd all had operations in their youth. They, thought this was odd. They stood there and talked about real estate and IRAs and investment until finally a cat from a lower class neighborhood came in through the fence and said, hi doll, how are you? And she screamed at him and he fought with her and they made love, I guess, I don't know. And then she beat him up and sent him off squawking. And a while after that, why the wonder of life happened on our kitchen floor, except she didn't consider it wonderful. The first little kitten in its little sack came out and she looked behind her with horror and disgust and she tried to walk away, but it was still attached to her. I'll never forget the look on that cat's face. What is this, she thought. And then there were two more after that. She needed coaxing to, to do what, what instinct was supposed to tell her to, but evidently she, she had forgotten. She, finally, she, she lay there in a box with three kittens and looked none too happy about it. And later that night, I got up to see how she was doing, and when I got up and went down to the kitchen, she got up too. And she came and rubbed against my leg, leaving her little family lying there blind and squeaking and hungry and needing her, but she didn't care. She walked to the back door and she scratched on it. And she wanted out. She'd had enough of spring and the wonder of life. And <laughs> I said, Mrs. Swanson, you can't go now. Look, think on this. Just look at it. You can't go. And I put the hook on the screen door. And she looked up at me. I don't know if you've ever had a mother cat curse at you. Just <laughs> swear at you. She, was, she didn't care for spring. She was restless. She wanted to get out and go. Anyway, Clarence, his tooth... Well, I've got to finish that story. <laughs> he suffered from that tooth uh, most, of, most of Friday morning until about 2 o'clock in the afternoon when Clint said he knew of a guy in St. Cloud. He said, he's good. You go in there, he'll take care of you. And he did. Clarence got in the car and went in, got in the chair half an hour later without any pain. The tooth was fixed. He couldn't believe it. It just went against his theology of dentistry. It's not supposed to be without pain and so easy. The Apostle Paul wrote about this in his epistle to the Anesthesians that <laughs> teeth are supposed to hurt. It's good for you. They're supposed to hurt real hard and you're supposed to let them hurt and sort of turn this pain towards God's glory through prayer. But Clarence got out easy, and it didn't hurt. He felt so wonderful. He felt romantic and extravagant. He was in St. Cloud. He walked down towards the mall. He saw the sign. He thought, why not? Go and get a haircut. <laughs> Usually he'd go into a barber shop with a name like Jim's or Bud's, and uh, some old guy in there, he'd sit and read the National Geographic for a while, get in the chair and uh, have his ears lowered and get an earful of wisdom about the fishing season. But this um, was a, a, different, uh, a different kind of a shop. It was, it was called Hair Today and Gone Tomorrow. And uh, <laughs> he walked in the door and the room was all black and white, black and white tile and chairs and the walls were white with black stripes and the ceiling was black and it smelled funny. 